My name is David Vitao, and I'm with my colleague uh, Marcel Persetia. And we're going to be discussing uh, how you can uh, build smart and scalable robots. We're going to be giving some demonstrations uh, of some robots today and also cover some of the new things uh, that are going on and, and coming out. So with that, I just want to jump over to switch or to a, a really quick demo of a robot. Um, I'm going to assume most of you are familiar with robots, um, but uh, we're just going to do that really quick. So I'm going to switch over to Wave, and I'm going to add a robot here. It's Dave Bot. So just like uh, any participant, you go ahead and add a robot directly to the Wave. And it immediately jumps in and says, hello. OK, so hello. Talk to it. Come back, want to play a game. So this is a robot I actually built to play games with. Um, it only plays one game right now. Uh, so sure, why not? So immediately jump in and put the chess gadget in. Now, I just want to mention real quick that there's no extra code here. This robot was actually created to play chess after the chess gadget was already created. This, in fact, was a gadget that was created um, for uh, players to play each other. Uh, but you know, robots have the same rights as humans, so it works pretty well if you code your robot to uh, know what the state of the board is. So I can come in and make a couple moves. And just like any human player, uh, the robot will start playing, so it jumps in, makes a move. Um, I'll just make a couple more moves here. See, it's pretty responsive, pretty quick. Um, of course, I know exactly what it's doing. And of course, I fall for the oldest trick in the book. So, um, so this is pretty cool. Um, little little chess robot. Again, I like uh, how it's decoupled from the actual game, the robot. So you can build multiple robots uh, to use the same chess gadget or, or whatever. So with that, I'm going to switch back. Oops, let's not jump too far. Um, again, just like any slide, we have a wave. Um, you can see the link down here um, to uh, ask questions. And you know, we'll look at that towards the end when we reach in and talk and take questions and answers. So what am I going to cover? What are we going to cover, rather? Uh, first, I want to give it a, just a quick overview over the API. Um, again, this is kind of like, you know, it's a 201 talk, so I assume uh, many of you are familiar with the robot API um, and have perhaps even used it. Um, but I'm just going to give a quick overview of, of what it is and, and how it works from a high-level architecture standpoint. Um, then we're going to cover what, what's new in version 2. In version 2, we launched, I guess, about a couple months ago um, after we received all the feedback um, and we kind of rolled out a whole bunch of features all at once, including uh, Active API and, and so on. So I'm going to cover that. And then we're going to do a deep dive. Marcel's going to um, come up and talk about um, how you can build super-powered robots. He's going to do that by going over some of the features and best practices of building robots, show some code, uh, and show a couple of uh, cool little demos that kind of um, open this up. And I, should, I just want to also point out that um, we're not just talking about robots here, because we're actually launching data liberation, which means you can actually access your waves and waves on behalf of other users um, using OAuth and, and so on. And this opens up a whole new uh, category of applications built on top of Wave. Um, you know, we can build standalone clients um, on any platform or, or whatever you want to do. Um, and we'll kind of touch on that a little bit. And then we're going to go over just a couple examples of robots that are built today. Um, we're going to just just a little bit of disassembling and say, well, what features do they use? Uh, what makes them unique? And finally, I'm going to talk about robot liberation, um, which is something that was announced um, yesterday during the keynote by Lars um, and, a, and, a couple, and in a couple other talks. And uh, no longer do you have to run robots in App Engine. And we think this is really cool, because you're not limited to Python or Java um, anymore. And uh, you can run on your own servers, which is especially great for building your own clients. So, so real quick, wave in two minutes or less. Um, we're kind of all showing this on the different wave slides. But uh, this is a screenshot of wave. And um, you know, our current tagline is, well, get stuff done with groups of people. Um, because we realize on the wave team, that's exactly what we do, um, and various other teams at Google as well. Um, and it works very well in that setting. And of course, we have a very simple sharing model. You, you, know, you start a wave, you add someone to that wave, and now they have access. Um, you can you know, jump in, reply anywhere to the wave. We have the live concurrent editing, which you're familiar with. Um, and of course, what this is uh, built upon is um, what we believe is actually really important to the wave ecosystem is the ability to add custom extensions. Um, and robots are just one type of that extension. Um, so that's all part of the wave client itself. So let's jump to an overview. 
So what's a robot? I mentioned a robot has the same rights as a human. So a human can jump into a wave, start editing, you know, replying anywhere, do whatever they want. Robots can do the same thing. And it's very important that we keep these two things in, in lockstep and keep them um, equal. Yeah, because uh, you, know, you want to be able to build robots that are just as powerful as their human, human uh, counterparts. Um, and so we do this using an HTTP-based JSON protocol uh, to listen to the events and to respond with operations. And I'm going to discuss real quick how that works. Um, and uh, so it's just a quick screenshot of you know, human and robot. They all appear on the participant panel uh, the same. And in fact, many times it's actually very difficult to, to tell the difference between a human and a robot, um, which I think is kind of a good thing. So this is just a couple images here um, to give a really, really high level overview of, of what the protocol looks like. Um, we have two things. One we call the active API, and one we call passive. Passive is what we originally launched with. Um, it was basically where you could say, well, when I have this robot at appspot.com, um, if someone adds that to a wave, uh, whenever there's modifications being done to that wave, I want to know about it. So we send you a JSON-based request, um, and then you can look at that or the robot can, rather, and respond with operations, also a JSON-based operation. Um, so it has that kind of, you know, that loop. It was a, you know, don't call us, we'll call you type model. With version two, we rolled out the active API um, using OAuth encoded requests uh, so that your robot can send ro or, uh, what do you call operations directly to our server without having to wait for any kind of uh, callback or anything like that. And that's great for a push, right? If you need to push content to wave, let's say your Twitter feed or or, or whatever, um, you can just start waves and, and start pushing uh, content into them and adding people and, and so on and so forth. And clients, of course, would see that um, happen real time in their, uh, in their browser. So that's just a real quick overview of, of the two types of, uh, of um, systems we have. Um, and as far as events go, so I mentioned that you, you know, robot receives events and then you know, gives operations. Uh, so what happens is um, when an event happens on the wave server, we send you a JSON encoded message, and uh, it has the contents of, well, what just happened in that event, right? So if you follow along here, um, you know, the wave server receives an event, like someone edited something or whatever. Um, we send that to one of our servers we call the robot proxy, and this server will take and concatenate all, all the events that occur and look at the robots around those waves and put them in the JSON-based format that the robot requires and send them out as HTTP requests and wait for a response, and that response can include operations. So this is sent via HTTP, and this is where the robot can actually process the event and say, okay, well, someone added this content, and I need to look at it and fix it up or whatever. And in fact, that's very much how uh, our spell checker works, uh, Spelly and, and Linky, you know, you type a link and wave. It looks like a, a link, so our robot looks at it and goes, yep, this is actually a, a link, and creates a link out of it. So I just want to give a really quick look at what this looks like. Um, this is the wrong window. So I'm going to switch over here and just show some JSON. Very simple, and I'm not going to jump into it, but this is our protocol. Um, you can see we have uh, you know, the events that occurred. For example, a blip submitted event occurred. Someone submitted a blip. Um, which wavelet did this happen on? Who edited it? Uh, when did it happen? And what, you know, what was part of that content? And this is all the information you basically need in order to introspect and see, well, you know, I care about this or I don't care about that or, or whatever. And then, of course, symmetrically, there's the operation side where once you receive an event, you know, you look at it and you go, okay, that's, that's great. I see this content. So now I want to, you know, m mess this up, change this, uh, annotate this content, add a link, whatever, right? And that all happens through our, our operation protocol. Um, so same thing. This all happens in a request. Uh, we actually send these back via JSON RPC, so you can batch them. You say, well, here's a bunch of operations I want you to apply sequentially over the wave or over this content. Robot proxy then takes it. This is our server. Um, and uh, looks at it, goes, yep, this looks good, everything's great, and then applies them to the wave server. So um, just again, let's take a quick look at what that is. So this is some operation JSON. Um, you could probably maximize this more, but... Um, so really all this is is a series of, it's an array of uh, JSON RPCs saying, look, uh, I want to uh, change the title, I want to I wanna modify some content, uh, whatever. So that's great, and that's the protocol, and we published that. So you can see, you can go on code.google.com, check it out, um, and it's very important that we publish this because, as I mentioned before, we're opening this up beyond App Engine. 
to the point where um, you, know, you could build client libraries to wrap that. And that's what we did at first. We open sourced two libraries, Python and, and Java, of, of course, for App Engine, um, to handle that protocol for you. So you don't have to deal with that. You could just focus on uh, modifying the model classes that we provided, the wave, wavelet, blips, and so on, and just focus on like, m you know, modifying content and, and what the robot actually does. And of course, uh, you know, what about these other languages? Well, it's not that we didn't like those other languages or didn't want to support them. It's just that you know, we were uh, limited by what uh, App Engine supported at the time. Um, so I, I, th I actually think a, a Ruby client was actually created at some point. Um, and I'm not sure how um, he did it, but I think he might have done some kind of proxying where you know, he'd receive an event uh, for, to his App Engine robot and then proxy it to his uh, Ruby server and, and do something kind of crazy. Um, so you don't have to do that anymore. And just a really quick uh, hello world. Um, this is in Python. It's one slide. And the robot's pretty dumb. Um, but you know, it demonstrates that we can have very little code, actually you know, a robot participating in the conversation. And what this one does is, well, when it gets added, it says, hey, you know, I'm here, makes itself known. And then when anyone ever gets added to the wave, so if, you, know, you add the robot and then you add some friends, that robot will say hello to them you know, when they get added to the wave, which isn't really useful, um, but uh, it's still kind of interesting in, in what three lines of code actually to, to do that part. And um, yep, so then you know, we had all these nice things like, yeah, you can do that. That's kind of, it's like a toy, basically. Um, so we looked at that and, and said, well, what do we need to do in order to make this really interesting or really powerful? So we came up with the version two, which has a few things, yeah? It has uh, more robust operations. Uh, these are operations that will run both on the client and the server. So you can say, look, find me this text. Find me some text that like, searches for Google and replace it with a link to you know, google.com. And so you would just send that to the server, and the server will run that logic for you, and it'll also run on your side so that the content matches. And uh, we think this is a much better way to, to, you know, to run these kind of operations, um, rather than you having to uh, look at the indices and, and go in and, and figure out what the annotation boundary should be and, and then send those off to the server. And by that time, of course, because people are typing in a wave, the content has already changed, and it doesn't mean anything, and, and things get all kind of crazy and out of control. And we don't want that. Um, next thing is bandwidth control. Because we were limited to App Engine, uh, quota became very important. In fact, there were a few robots that we launched, and they became, and other people launched, and they became somewhat popular, and all of a sudden they stopped working. It's like, well, why did they stop working? Because, of course, they hit their quota, um, because we were sending so much traffic. Um, and if someone, we had this you know, operation, or we still do, we have this uh, event called document changed. And document change means, well, send me an event every time any of the content changes. Uh, and you can imagine, of course, if someone's in there typing and editing blips, the robot's receiving lots and lots of JSON, lots and lots of content, and that'll blow out your coda very quickly. Um, so what we did is we, we allow you to control what you're interested in. So you can say, well, I want to know when document changes, but I wanna, only want to know if it contains you know, this regular expression or, or you know, whatever, things like that, right? And that's much more important because then the uh, work is done on the server as opposed to you know, us just sending you information and 99% of the time going, well, this, I don't care about this, just drop it on the floor. So that's very important as well. Um, and then a couple of the things I'll just highlight real quick are profile semantics. Now you know, robots can actually, um, well, they can also act on behalf of the users, but they can look like they're from other users. So if you have a Twitter stream coming in from a robot, um, you know, you want to be able to actually say, who is this from, right? Who's this post from? Uh, show their profile image, show their name, and so on. So we allow you to do that uh, with a system we call Proxy4, um, which Marcel will cover, and he, he has a pretty cool demonstration of that and YouTube. And then finally, at Google, we take data liberation very seriously, um, meaning that, well, any data that you put into our services, you should be able to get out at any time and take it to another service. And Wave's no exception. Yep. We want you to be able to uh, input content into Wave, whether it's through the robot API or directly in Wave, and have application developers write applications that can pull your content, do something with it, store it, whatever you need to do um, you know, to, to, to make it useful. So we did that with um, allowing you to search across Waves and also fetch wavelets. Um, and so you can say, well, I know I'm on this wave. Give me this content, and, and I want to take it and store it and, and do something with it later, or maybe push it back later. Um, so it's that whole two-way uh, transfer that we have. And that's really, really important to uh, new applications that, you know, that uh, 
we think will be developed, uh, you know, new clients or Android applications or whatever, um, which is, is really important. Um, yep, so with that, I'm actually going to switch over uh, to Marcel here, and he's going to go through a few of these new features um, and demonstrate them and, and give a couple cool demos. So, Marcel. Thanks, David. Hey, everyone. My name is Marcel Prosetia. I'm a software engineer on the Google Wave team. Um, today, I'm going to talk about some of the new features and best practices on the Google Wave Robots API version 2 that we launched about a few months ago. Um, some of the topics that I'm going to cover are, uh, first one is the new document modify operation, and then uh, context and filtering, and then proxy for, and last one is the active robot API. Now, without further ado, let me just jump in to the first one, the document modify operation. So in the first version of our API, in V1, most of our operations were indexed and range-based, which result in a very error-prone, fragile, and and cumbersome API. So take, for example, if you want to replace all occurrences of foo with bar in a blip, this is what the code would look like in v1. So first, you need to get the text view of the blip, and then you need to uh, loop over of all the, all the occurrences of foo in that text view and use that to comp compute the range and then call the text view dot replace method and pass in the range and also replacement text. So we think that's just way too much code for such a very simple operation. So in the V2 API, we introduced this new operation called document modify that allows you to modify blip content without using index or range as the reference. So in V2, replace foo with bar, the, the code will look like this. Blip dot all foo dot replace bar. So it's a lot simpler more readable, and also more intuitive. Now let's take a look at the components of this operation, namely the selectors and action. So I have a sample code here, same as before, blip all foo dot replace bar. So the first part, all foo, is a selector. So selector is something that restricts and, and targets which part of the blip this operation should be applied to. We support a few different selectors. Um, we have all and first, and should you need to apply operations using index or range, like in the V1 API, we also support add and range selector. The second part, replace bar, is an action. So action is something that dictates the server what needs to be done on the regions that were matched by the selectors. We support insert, insert after, replace, delete, and annotate. So I have a table. Um, up here that show you the, the list of selectors and actions that we currently support. Now I'm going to switch uh, to my Wave client here and show you a little demo um, of a Wave robot that uses this document modify operations to linkify the word um, Google and YouTube. OK, I have my Wave client here. First of all, I'm going to create a new wave with that robot in it. I call my robot wave linky. And I'm going to type in something, hello, Google I.O. Have you seen our video on YouTube? And then hit submit. So when I hit submit, the wave server will broadcast an event, the blip submitted event, to the robot. So this wavelinky robot will receive that event, including the blip content, and will search for all occurrences of Google and linkify that. And same thing with YouTube. As you can see now, Google is underlined, and, and if I click on this, I'll, I'll be directed to google.com um, homepage. And same thing with YouTube. OK, let me, let me close that. Well, I'm going to switch back to my presentation. So I'm going to sh show you the code to do that. It's very simple. So it's just blip.all, Google, annotate, link manual, and then the google.com URL. So we use all as the selector and annotate as the action. And same thing for YouTube. It's just blip.all, YouTube, annotate, link manual, youtube.com. I'm going to show you a few more sample codes here that uses document modify operations. So the first one that I have um, next to the Google example there is uh, it's a gadget blocker robot. So the code is blip.all element type gadget dot replace block. So this, this code will look for all gadgets in a blip and replace it with the text block. 
the next example that I have here, we'll, we'll look for the first image in the blip and insert the text TM. So the code is blip.first element type image dot insert after TM. And the last example that I have, uh, as I mentioned before, we also support selectors um, that, that are um, index and range based. So I'm using range here. The code is blip.range 6, 12, delete. So basically, this will delete the blip content from index 6 to 12. So that was document modify operation. So again, with this operation, you can do a lot of things, a lot of um, dot, um, blip content manipulation operations without worrying too much about um, index or range computation. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is um, context and, and also filter. So in V2 API, we give the robot more flexibility in controlling how much data and how much event should be broadcasted to the robot by specifying the context and filters. So first one, context specifies which blip should be included in an event bundle if there is an event for that, for that robot. So you can specify root, parent, self, siblings, or children as your context. Should you need all the blips in that wave, you can also specify all. Second one, filter. So filter tells the server to only send a, an event bundle to the robot if that event has a property that matches the given regular expression filter. So by specifying context and filter properly, you could help to reduce the bandwidth and CPU usage of your robot. This is very true, especially if your robot is listening to a very chatty event, for example, the document change event on a large wave. And also, if you're using Google App Engine as your uh, hosting provider, um, App Engine has um, quotas. So by specifying context and filters, you can help to reduce your uh, quota usage. Uh, now I'm going to show you a, a sample Java code on how to specify context and filter. So I have a simple event handler method here that handles document change event. And the way you specify context and filters are by setting them as attributes of the capability annotation. So I have at capability context equal context.parent, comma context.self, and then filter is just text Google with double brackets. So what this means is that the server will only broadcast this a document change event to this robot if that event happens on a blip with the, the with the word Google in it in double bracket. And also when the server broadcasts this event to the robot, it will include two blips in the event bundle. Namely, the blip where the event happens, the self, and also the parent blip of that, of that blip. So that's context and filter. Again, with context and filter, you could help to reduce your uh, bandwidth and CPU consumption, so you can uh, be frugal with it. Next one I'm going to talk about is the proxying for feature. This is also a new feature in the V2 API. So with this feature, a single robot can represent many sub-participants in the format of robot ID plus proxy ID at appspot.com. So in a way, with, this, with proxying for, a robot can implement its own participant namespace. And all events that are happening for the proxy participants will be sent to that single robot. So in this case, it will be sent to this robot ID dot appspot.com. And then that robot can process the, uh, those event bundles and then reply with, uh, with operations uh, on behalf of those proxy participants. So robot that acts as a gateway for an external service provider, for example, like uh, YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook, can use uh, the proxying for feature to send operations kind of on behalf of that service provider user. For example, like a YouTube robot, YouTube at asphalt.com, can send replies, like post comments, back into Wave as if the, the comments were coming from a YouTube user, like in this case, user1, by sending operations authored by YouTube plus user1 at appspot.com. Now, now I'm going to switch over to my Wave client again. I'm going to show you uh, a sample YouTube robot that I hacked over the weekend. Let's see if this works. So um, basically, this robot will, um, will display the Dr. Wave intro to Wave tutorial video and also fetch the last three comments. So, so first, let me create a new Wave with that robot in it. 
has a YouTube logo. So, all right, so it, it displays the video in the root lib and then displays the last three comments. Okay, so the last comment is, is from Roadbiker. I like his lab code. So I'm now I'm gonna switch over to YouTube. Just reload this, just to make sure that the last comment is indeed from Roadbiker. Cocobos, click that. His name is Road, okay. And it says, I like his lab code, okay. All right, so, as you can see here, the, the comments were um, attributed to the YouTube user. So like Sephora here, Invictus 1983, and Road Bikers, they're not Wave users, they're YouTube users. And if you click on the participant profile, uh, on, the, uh, on the thumbnail here, you can just, the profile card shows that this blip was actually created by Empressethia-YouTube, that is my robot ID, plus Cocobos, which is the YouTube user ID, at appspot.com. So we use the YouTube user ID as the proxy ID here. Also, you may wonder, like, how does the client display this, this custom profile information uh, that's coming from YouTube? So when the server needs to render a proxy participant uh, profile information, it will actually talk to the robot. It will make a profile request to the robot and pass in the proxy ID. And robot can take that proxy ID, and in this case, the YouTube robot will use that to query YouTube to give me a, a profile information for Cocobos. So then YouTube will respond with, uh, with the display name here, Road Biker, and also the thumbnail URL for, for this user. Now I'm gonna switch back to my presentation and show you the code to do that. It's very simple. So first, um, the robot will just fetch the comments from YouTube this line here. Fetch the comments from YouTube by just passing uh, the video ID, and uh, I have a separate method that makes the uh, GData call to YouTube to fetch the comment. And then for each comment, the robot extracts the user information and use that to create a proxy version of the wavelet by calling wavelet.proxy4 and passing the, that YouTube user ID as the proxy ID here. So once you have that proxy wavelet, you can start making com uh, replies. So you can start sending operations on behalf of that proxy participant. So in this case, um, I'm, the robot calls the reply method, proxy wavelet.reply, to post a comment. Okay, so um, that was uh, proxying for. Again, with uh, proxying for, you can, uh, if, you, if you build uh, a gateway robots that bridge wave with an external service provider, you can, um, you can push contents into wave and properly attribute the contents, co properly attribute the blip with that service provider user. So the next thing that I'm gonna talk about is the Active Robot API, which was one of the top requested features since we launched the version one of our API. So in, in V1, robot can only send operations in response to event. So robots were passive. Um, so it cannot do anything useful un, un, until the server talks to the robot or broadcasts an event to the robot. So then we decided in, in the V2 API, we introduced this notion of the active API where robot can send operations on demand at any time to our server, even outside the event loop. So to accomplish this, we provide an HTTP server that handles HTTP and HTTPS requests that robot can make the active calls to. So basically, robot is, uh, can just make JSON RPC call to the server to send the active call. So the call will be done over HTTPS, so the data will be encrypted, and also the call will be signed and authenticated with OAuth, with two-legged OAuth. So before you can start using the active API, you need to register your robot to do the, this one-time registration process to get your consumer key in secret. Now I'm gonna show you uh, again, this is my uh, YouTube robot. So with the active API, if you have a gateway robot, for example, like this uh, YouTube robot, you can, um, you can make this robot to push things or update waves if there is an event on the external service. 
So I'm gonna make this robot a little bit more interesting. I'm gonna introduce a cron job that will periodically check YouTubes and see if there's any new comments on this Dr. Wave video. And if there is one, it will po post that new comments back into Wave. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to YouTube and I'm gonna post a new comment. I will say, I like his lab code too. Then hit post. And then I'm gonna switch over back to Wave. And if you're lucky, in a few seconds, uh, you should see my new you should see my new post. So, okay, there you go. Hooray, it works. Didn't work this morning. Um, <laughs> ba basically, um, so Basically, the scron job will go, will go to YouTube, use the YouTube GData API, fetch for the last comment. And if there's a new comment, it will make an active call back into Wave to post this, um, to post this new comment. So I'm going to switch over to my presentation and show you how, how to use uh, active API to, in, your, uh, in your code, the robot code. So I, I have the robot, uh, the cron handler here. First thing that you need to do is to establish your uh, OAuth credential by calling um, the setup OAuth method on the, on the robot. So call robot.setupOAuth and pass in the consumer key and, and secret. And then I'm gonna create a stop wavelet. So you can do this in two ways. So, so you can create a stop wavelet by calling robot.blind wavelet and then you can apply operation to it. Or you can also fetch the wavelet by calling robot.fetch wavelet. I prefer to do the blind wavelet here because it's, it's faster and I don't need the actual wave content. So, and then I'm gonna talk to, to YouTube called this get comments method again to fetch, for the, fetch the new comments and use the, the technique that we talked uh, earlier in the proxy for slides to post these new comments back to the wave. And then lastly, the most important bit in, uh, in the active API is you need to actually submit your pending operations by calling this uh, submit method. So you do robot.submit, and you pass in the wavelet, and the URL, which is the URL of the server that handles incoming active call. So the URL here is https www.opensocial.googleusercontent.com slash API slash RPC. So when you call submit, several things will happen. First, the client library will inspect the operation queue of that wavelet and serialize the pending operations into JSON. And then, once that's serialized, it will prepare an HTTP request, and then we'll sign that HTTP request with, with OAuth using your consumer key in secret and make an HTTPS call to the server. So when the server receives this um, uh, active call request, first it will, it will validate the it'll validate the incoming call to make sure that it has the proper uh, OAuth signature um, just to, uh, so that we can authenticate like which robot is actually making this active call. Once it succeeds validation, the server will start applying the operation and you can start seeing the updates in a wave. And then once the, robot, uh, once the server is done processing those operations, it will send a JSON RPC response back to the to robot. So then you can inspect if there's any error if, or if there's any other message in, uh, in the response. Okay, so one other thing that I would like to mention here. So someone just reply. Is it one of you guys? Um, so as, as you probably noticed before, like I didn't do anything in this wave. I did not type anything. I did not add a participant. I did not submit a blip. I didn't do anything. So it was purely the robot that's making active call back into the wave server. So um, again, so that's um, active API. So with that, you can start pumping operations day in and day out, day out to our wave server. All right, so now we've talked about some of the uh, best practices and the new features in the V2 API. I'd like to hand the floor back to David to do some deep dive on some sample robots. David? Yep. Um, is my mic on? No? Sound? Yes? Okay, good, perfect. 
Right, so I want to stop there real quick and um, just give a couple of opinions. Um, so Marcel you know, covered about you know, how to push data into Wave. Um, but really, recently, we actually, um, and this is bleeding edge, I guess, um, opened up the ability for you to push content to Wave on behalf of other users using uh, what we call, or what OAuth calls, three-legged OAuth. Um, this is, I know I said a, few, a number of things are important, um, but to me especially, very, very important and going to be very, very interesting, right? Because, you know, love it or hate it, um, you don't need to go to our client anymore. Um, we can actually build applications that allow you to use Wave as a, a platform, right? Remember, this product platform and protocol um, is a platform um, for, for your data, right? And you get all the concurrency, you get all the active push, you get all the, um, you know, everything that Wave is known for, um, but without having to actually go to the client. Um, and so, you know, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be rolling out more documentation and more examples of this, um, you know, with an Android application um, sample, uh, with an, uh, I guess what you can call maybe a Wave Lite type implementation um, of a client. And, uh, you know, I'm really, really interested to see what developers can do with that um, to kind of, again, circumvent the client and push and extract content directly out of our, the platform that we've built. So I just wanted to stop and, and mention that. Um, and now I'm going to jump over to just a few examples of robots using some of the things that Marcel pointed out. Um, well, one is uh, Monty, and this is actually a robot that I built, uh, I guess, last year. Um, and I just want to show it really quick because um, it does, it's, it's, it's fairly interesting um, to kind of see how Wave can be used as almost like an IDE, right, an interactive IDE. So what Monty does is it's a Python interpreter, or a Python-based robot that evaluates Python code that you put into Wave, and then it outputs the result directly, yeah? So, you know, you can communicate, or you can, <laughs> we have a tagline, uh, you can collaborate on, uh, on the code directly and have the robot run it. Um, and the features it used are uh, Wavelet self-added and blip submitted. Very simple, nothing complex going on. Um, so let's just jump over to demo real quick. Um, I'm going to attempt to write some code um, directly in, in Wave here. So I add Monty. He says, yep, input the program. So I'm going to input, um, let's say, a Fibonacci program. Um, by the way, there's a bug in this code, and if you can point it out after this is over, perhaps at the mic, we'll send you a t-shirt. Um, so, let's do this. Right. Okay. So now I should just be able to, we have this little um, wave.set result, or result. So this should give me the output of Fibonacci of 10, right, so 89, um, which I do know is the output of 10. Um, and of course, you can come in and change or add other people to do it and, you know, do whatever you need to do uh, to your program to modify it live. I don't know. I guess that's probably right. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, of course, it, you can come in and also, let's say you have an error in your program. Monty will tell you that, well, here's the error. Um, so it's, you know, again, this is actually a, a robot that was written in very few lines of code. Um, I can hop over to that show you, this is the entire program written in Wave, actually. Um, so there's just some code that, that, that uh, this is all the Python-specific code that will actually run the program for you. Um, and then down below is the, is the Wave code um, that says, well, when a blip submitted comes in, if this is the root blip, that's good. I'm going to process it. Otherwise, just jump out, execute the program, and then take the content and output it to the first uh, blip and just feed the result directly through. Very simple. Um, but yet very powerful. And again, as I was saying, um, you know, this doesn't have to be done in the client, right? With this and with the OAuth-enabled system, you can actually build an IDE that pushes content into Wave, allows people to collaborate on it um, and get results back and still use robots and, and all of that sort of thing. So it'll be interesting. Mr. Ray. Mr. Ray is actually one of my favorite robots because it kind of goes into the direction that I'm talking about. Um, with alternative clients. Um, so what Mr. Ray does, um, it's actually very clever and very well architected. Um, it allows non-Wave users to actually participate in conversations when they're not on Wave, yeah? So how do you do that? Well, you, you, you don't, you make it so that they don't have to go into Wave to actually participate. Right? This is actually really clever. 
Um, and uh, this is probably the reason why it won first place and um, uh, Mashable put on a API contest. Um, and Mr. Ray, I think, took that um, pretty quickly. Um, so some of the features it uses are proxy for, which, which Marcel demonstrated, because if someone's gonna be, if you're gonna be pushing content to Wave, you need to know uh, who is this, right? If there's some other Joe Schmo at gmail.com uh, needs to, you know, reply, you're communicating with them and they reply uh, to the Wave, well, you need to know that that's where it's coming from and not actually the robot itself. And I'll show you what I mean by that. And also I wanna say that it, it also uh, uses a gadget for um, control flow, right? Uh, that's, uh, a typical pattern that people use. The, the robot inserts a gadget, it's kind of like a control panel to use. Again, it's, it's very clever. So I'm not gonna show the whole thing, I'm just going to jump over to some examples that I have. Um, so I have a Mr. Ray wave, right, where I actually uh, have Mr. Ray on the wave, and I've added um, myself, my personal Gmail, and myself, my other self, uh, to the wave. And you can see here there's this uh, control panel where I've added myself, and this is a simple conversation. Um, now these avatars could be changed, but um, right now it's, it's using a, um, you know, just a little a symbol denoting that it's coming from Mr. Ray. Um, but this is actually from you know, Crazy Waver, which is um, the Gmail account of, of this Wave account. Um, and so there's a conversation going on here. So if I switch back and I say, hey, now what that other user has is, is a client to actually go and see that content and reply to it. Um, so if I jump back to my links, this is what they're presented with when you add them to this wave with Mr. Ray, not the redirect notice. They're presented with an actual, yes. Um, so this is kind of like, you know, it's a view of the wave. It's, it's got some buttons for reply. It's, it's simple, but, but it's, it works, right? Um, and even more so now, you don't need to do this with robots anymore. You can actually do it uh, with having the user um, log into this and authenticate with us, come back, and now they're authenticated to our wave client you can push content directly in on, on their behalf. You don't have to do any kind of proxy for anything like that. They're an actual user at that point. Um, so, you know, of course you can come and reply, you know, and same, same story, it'll, it'll push the content back and I come back into Wave and of course um, it's there. Yep, so um, again, it's, it's, it is an alternative client, right? Um, and it's, it's very neat, very clever. Um, and then just one more robot I wanna show before we jump into the robot liberation uh, is Ferry. Now this, I wanted to show this because um, you know, one of the themes of, of, of IO is, is enterprise development. And aside from you know, nice little uh, toys and, and robots and such, it's very important that you be able to get your content into other services, right? Like Google Docs, for example. Um, and Ferry does just that. It exports waves into Google Docs and allows you to take it and save it there and modify it and, and uh, collaborate that way and then push content back into Wave. So I'm just gonna demonstrate that very quickly. Um, it uses OAuth, by the way, for access. So when you're in Wave, you can grant access to uh, Google Docs or grant access to the robot um, on, on your behalf uh, for Google Docs. Um, I said it right the first time. Uh, so let's jump over here and look at a Wave. Um, so it's very simple to use. You install Ferry through the, um, through the uh, extension gallery and, and it shows up on the toolbar when you're in edit mode. So I started this document. Um, I can actually probably just jump through real quick and, and give you a quick demonstration. Um, so again, sample document, pretty boring. Um, let's pretend this is a really long document that I've, we've been working on, collaborating on, and so, and so on. I can't type when I'm on, <laughs> it's cool. Um, so on the toolbar, you'll see that there's this icon which uh, is available. So you click that icon, Ferry jumps on the wave and goes, okay, I wanna access this. Here's again, another gadget used for um, controlling uh, what's happening um, rather than you know, having to parse text and so on. It, it works very, very well. So yep, I'm just gonna say go, great. Click here to grant access. It does a little OAuth dance. Um, yep, grant access. Of course, once you're authenticated, you, sh you should remain authenticated at that point. Um, I think I clicked it. Anyway, we're gonna jump over here and, okay, so this says it will sync automatically. It's a little bit slow. S yep, an error occurred, perfect. Um, so, but luckily I did create a document before. I ran through this just before the demonstration or just before the session. And, I do have a document which is very similar, which is, again, this is a sample document. 
You can look at this in docs, and it's a nice way. And now this was just a start. Yeah, there's actually a talk later on today which describes getting content in and out of Wave. Uh, it's the media APIs, and it's more than just documents. It's also images and attachments and so on. Um, but you can see that the robot API is at least powerful enough for allow you, allowing you to do this sort of thing um, you know, today. So that was a few robots. Um, robot liberation. Now this actually was something we've been talking about. You know, we realized um, uh, over the last year, we, we've given a number of talks and, and always said, well, today uh, robots run an app engine, but tomorrow you know, we, we promise we'll open it up. Um, and you know, for one reason or another, we're working on, you know, with our limited resources, working on some, a lot of the other features that Marcel demonstrated. Um, so a few weeks ago, we said, well, why haven't we done this yet? There's, there's not really a, a, a great reason, and, and it's a really big bang feature, right? Um, so we did it, and um, it works today. Um, we're gonna be rolling out some more uh, documents over the week uh, to make it easier, and a few updates. It's, it's, it's not as seamless as I'd like it, today, admittedly, but um, it will be very, very soon. But it does work. Um, so I just mentioned all that. Um, I'm not going to go over how it works completely. It's, it's not that important. There's a flow where essentially you, you know, the same old story where you, you have your URL that you want your robot to live on, or rather you want events to be sent to that URL. Yeah. And then, but you have to, um, say, prove ownership of that domain or of that URL. So what we do is we have a form where um, we'll say, look, this is what I want my robot ID to be, which would be something like, you know, waverobot at googlewaverobots.com, which, by the way, means we're moving away from appspot.com and onto our own domain. Um, and this is my URL. We've got to prove ownership. So we give you a token that you have to serve up, and then you come back, click verify. We make sure you put that token on the URL. Great. And then we issue you your ID. We issue you your consumer key and secret, and off you go. And you can add that robot. So there was a Go talk earlier today. Um, and uh, you know, Go is an interesting language to me. I, I don't really know it, but I, I want to learn it. But there was a developer who, who really likes Wave, and he's on the Go team. Um, so when he found out that we were opening up robots like this literally two weeks ago, um, he built a client library. Uh, and he's, he's still working on it. It'll be open source very soon. And I said, well, that's great. That's awesome. Let's, uh, let's demo that. Um, so that's what we're going to do real quick. Just, you know, it's a very simple, um, simple robot. Before I actually show the demo, I just want to highlight the code for a, for a Go robot. Um, it looks very similar to Python. It's, it's very easy to use. If you're familiar with Python, you'd be familiar with how to use the Go uh, language. Um, and uh, all this does is a simple hello world. The robot demo I'm going to show is actually a little bit more sophisticated. So let's do that. So I'm going to jump over here actually to my sandbox. Again, I, should, I, I forgot to mention that a Robot Liberation is only available on Sandbox today. Um, very soon, uh, it'll be available on, the, uh, on, on our public instance. And I promise it won't take as long as it took for us to get off of App Engine. Um, it will actually be very soon. So jump over here. And you'll see that I can add um, GoBot. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to submit this blip. Oops. I'm going to add GoBot. So, GoBot is actually at googlewaverobots.com. And I can show you that it's actually not an app engine. OK, he says hi. If I click his profile, you can see that his website, actually, that doesn't prove it. But I assure you that this is not running on App Engine. Uh, this is running on uh, his VPS. Um, uh, and uh, you know, we're, just off, you know, we're just sending requests directly to that. So if I come over here, I say hi. Go is new programming language, Go. And then, of course, it can reply. And it's very quick. You notice that things are much snappier these days, um, which is great. And it can embed, you know, embeds a video about Go and, and so on. So, um, you know, very basic. But, um, he, you know, he, he built this in literally a week. And uh, we're excited to see, you know, various other languages being used. And it's great because, um, you know, with App Engine, App Engine is stateless, right? So uh, anything that comes in, you, you, you get a request, you send a response back. Um, if you want to store any kind of state, you have to store it in the data store. It's, it's, it's a little bit uh, tricky. Um, but when you're running on your own server, you can have locally cached states and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's great. And then, you know, there's a number of other languages that things could be ported to. I don't, I just came up with a list. I had another one in mind, but I never typed it. Um, hence the empty bullet point. Um, so hopefully we'll, you know, see some of these very soon using uh, our protocol. 
Everything I mentioned today, um, and Marcel mentioned, um, is available in example, except for the little anecdotal um, stories, um, at code.google.com slash API slash wave. Like I said, we're going to be diligently updating the documentations, um, or the documentation, and uh, you know, with, with how to uh, liberate your robots and, and, and uh, the OAuth stuff, which, which is um, going to be pretty interesting. Um, so you can look forward to that. And um, yep, so that pretty much concludes our talk. I just want to thank you for uh, coming and listening to this. Um, we're going to uh, check out the wave, see if there's any questions. Otherwise, please you know, feel free to ask a question on the mic. Again, if you saw a bug on the, on the uh, Fibonacci program, feel free to mention that too, uh, and we'll send you a t-shirt. Um, so um, yep, so that's it. Thank you. Oh, we got it. Okay, so yes, sir. Uh, robot liberation is very exciting. I was wondering if you have a fine-grained time scale as to when we can expect that documentation. Yep. So I think the documentation is available now as far as the flow goes. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in fact, I ran through the registration just before the session. It's, it's all good. Um, the only thing that's changing is um, just a few updates to make it a little bit uh, um, easier to do, right? Because right now you register your ID. If it's a taken ID, it's not clear imme mm. immediately. Um, but uh, bear with us there, and, and we'll be fixing it up. So. Super. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Um, I may have just missed the slide, but in your cron handler method that was getting mm -hmm. called periodically, um, how do you actually uh, route a URL to that method? Oh, so, um, so for my example robot, I just use uh, app engine cron or uh, app engine uh, task queue, you can do that. OK. And yeah. you, you can like directly assign your method to an action that occurs periodically? So yeah, so the way app engine cron and uh, task queue work is just basically a servlet that app engine system will, will call uh, in a peri uh, period of time. So it's so that you can just put that method inside a servlet, and then inside, uh, inside the get handler, you can just call that method. OK. Uh, and OK, I'll look at the API for that. Um, yeah. And the Fibonacci sequence, I believe, was incorrect for an argument of zero. <laughs> zero and one, yes. Yeah. Yep, that's yeah. right. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, let me jump over to the wave, because let me see if there was anything real quick. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to jump on. Um, is this half the thing? No, it doesn't. Oh, live, no live wave? Can I open this? Uh, no. So, yeah. Sure. We're just going to check real quick. I think uh, one of the questions someone asked was, um, when can Skype, Skype be used as a bot? Um, you know, I don't think we're going to be supporting anything like that anytime soon. Um, but we have talked about uh, either you know, voice integration or, or whatever in, in Wave in general. But um, as far as a Skype bot goes, um, you know, I, I mean, I guess it, it, it could technically feasibly be built. Um, but you know, I don't know if anyone's working on that. I know there are uh, voice chat uh, applications that are in Wave today, though. Oh, Wave's not trashed. <laughs> so it seems like, uh, just real quick, um, yeah, I guess one question I wanted to jump up is, uh, what's the best way to have a robot interact with participants on a Wave, replying, using a gadget, or so on? Uh, I just want to say it's up to you. You saw that you know you can use uh, gadgets to control the flow. I think that's uh, one great way of doing things. So that's yep. it. Anyway, guys. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Is there is there a, uh, an example you may have or you may have seen with whether it's like an oddvoc type um, robot that can interact? And I'm interested in like a, making a little customer service type application where somebody could visit a website. They could be at that page, and they could sort of interact in like a sort of human fashion, mm -hmm. and then be handed off to a real human if 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 the if the robot can't handle the situation. Totally. Um, so, yeah. I we've always wanted to make our robots more conversational in that way, right? To seem like you're actually communicating with something. You know, a lot of uh, call services do that. You kind of ask questions, like, nope, okay, now let's fall back to a real human. Um, I, I think that's true, and also you can actually build web applications that. You know, it's on your website where you're, you can you know, uh, be getting content back and forth from Wave. Right? 
and actually have people maybe go into Wave. You know, if you have someone working on, on you know, someone working uh, at some company or something that gets these waves that get questions feed it, fed into them, they can reply, and then of course those replies will be pushed back out to your robot or to your service to kind of close that loop, right? So you can use it for that kind of um, you know, communication loop, and, and either way it could be robot or human participant. Um, I don't know if that answers your question directly, but you know, we can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so basically inside your robot uh, event handler, you can just do whatever you want including like making um, you know, HTTP calls or somewhere or sending emails or uh, basically uh, just integrating that to yeah, your Yeah, but service. what you're saying is something that we've always thought would be a great use case. Yeah. Nope. All right, well again, thanks guys. Oh, oh. Um, yes sir. <laughs> I'm really just bad a, at looking at these. Just a quick question. Is there any plan for uh, wizards um, for making robots? in the Eclipse plugin? Yes, there's, um, if I understand your question correctly, there, we, there is a robot, so like a tutorial, like a helper for building robots, you mean? Uh, I'm sorry, could you, re can you repeat? You said you, like a wizard or a helper for building uh -huh. robots? Yeah. Uh, yep, so there's so robot robot. Yeah, so robot robot is a robot IDE inside Wave. <laughs> so, uh, but I think your question was about if, there, if, there's, if we have any Eclipse plugin for robots API or not. Right. Yeah. Correct. So we currently don't have that, but um, that's simply really something that we should keep in mind. Uh, I think um, typically when I develop a new robot, I install the App Engine plugin for uh, for Eclipse, and that's very convenient for me. And I think yeah, we should definitely look into that too. Yeah, that's yeah. what I used to. I was thinking of um, graphical wizards that right. uh, would uh, ask questions to the user to the right. coder. Then and, gen and then generate a skeleton of robots. We, we actually had a, um, an intern on the team build a uh, uh, kind of a meta robot that uh, adds a gadget and you can actually construct logic through a flowchart like system. Yeah? And we haven't released that yet. We mm -hmm. just kind of kept it internally so far. But it's great for building tutorial robots. So tutorial being like wave tutorial or whatever. So you would say like, you know, do this and branch on this when the user like presses enter or replies, and, and it kind of just, you can build a simple conversational robot graphically, so. Very nice. Yep. It, uh, is it possible to see a screen capture of it? Um, not yet, but um, now that, you know, that there's interest, I know we've been planning to uh, either push it out, we want to push out as an example, at least, very mm -hmm. soon. Um, so we'll probably publish the code and, and do that. Because okay. yep, it's really Thank neat. Thank you. Sure. All right, thanks guys. Thanks guys for coming.